Now, uh, getting into the sermon, we've spent uh, the past six weeks examining the life of Moses and the types and shadows that we see within his life that point us to Christ. Well, today we're going to look at a woman named Abigail. Now, God created both man and woman in his image, and in these two image bearers, we see a clearer image of God. When we look at man, we don't see the best image. When we look at woman, we don't see the best image. It is together in God's creation that we see the clearer image of God. He does not compromise the truth for feelings. He meets the broken where they are. He is strong and steadfast. He is compassionate and merciful. This being the case, types and shadows are not only found in the lives of the men in Scripture, but also in the women in Scripture. And so as I was studying this sermon, I noticed that this is really the only chapter in all the Bible that speaks to Abigail. There there are other references, but it doesn't speak to her character at all or her life per se, just mentioning who she is or there was an event that she was involved in. But this chapter reveals an awful lot about a very special woman. And it got me thinking, what if there was one chapter written about us, would it be a good chapter? If all of our lives, one chapter was picked and put in Scripture, I can't guarantee that would have been a good day. But going back into the story, we know that Samuel has died. And verse 1 brings into focus a subtle call to action for the church today. It says, Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. And then David arose. See, there was mourning. Samuel has gone to be with the Lord, and this is something that we all know all too well. In fact, we should mourn when a godly man or godly woman is no longer with us. Samuel has served the Lord his entire life, and mourning is widespread throughout Israel. But notice, even in the midst of this, even in the midst of this mourning, we see, then David arose. One scholar summarized it like this, God's work may begin with one man, but it never ends with one man. When one is gone, the mantle must be taken up by someone else. And this is kind of a larger scope thing for for the body of Christ as a whole. In this church, we make up the body of Christ, but this church makes up the body of Christ among this community. This is not the only church in Morristown. And so there's purpose and mission and guidance within this body that fits into the larger scope of the rest of the community. Now, we may not know all the ministries and all the people leading those things among all the other churches, but God does. And so one of the hurdles that churches face is when someone steps down or someone leaves or someone goes home to be with the Lord and the ministry that they were leading is left without someone to take up that mantle, what happens a lot of times in churches is we force someone to take it up so it can continue. We're not waiting for someone who's called to do it. We're forcing someone to do it. But one of the things that we have to consider and trust in God is, is in those situations, When that mantle has no one to be taken up in our body, it means that God has not called us or equipped us to do it. Perhaps, and our trust is in this, He has been creating and cultivating and and equipping another church to take that mantle and put it in theirs so that we will fulfill the call that He has for us here. What I'm getting at is, There's going to be a time as a church has existed as long as ours, there's going to be ministries that we need to let go. And it's not a judgment. It's not a we failed. It's not anything like that. It's a trust in God going, this is meaningful, and we know that God is going to do it, but we don't don't have someone to do it here. That's not a knock on us. What we need to be asking is, God, what have you equipped us and empowered us to do With this ministry gone, what do we need to do? And that's something that we need to wrestle with as we move forward. 
But there's another event taking place in this chapter. So David, he had been protecting, without asking for anything in return, Nabal's shepherds. And this is an incredible gesture as, it's, as it not only protects Nabal's livestock from animals or robbers and such, it also protects his shepherds. And so Nabal didn't lose any livestock or any men when David's men were with them. And we don't know how long this has been going on, but the text communicates that it's been a period of time. And this is where we see two introductions, and I want to focus on the lesser first, and that's Nabal. Scripture says that he is rich. One commentator described Nabal in this way. In describing his wealth, he says, There are four kinds of riches. There are riches in what you have, riches in what you do, Riches in what you know, and riches in who you are. Nabal was a rich man, but only rich in what he had. He had the lowest kind of riches. We further see the indication of his character, or lack thereof, as his name Nabal means fool. The text says that Nabal was a harsh and badly behaved person. In addition, he was a Calebite. Now, the writer is bringing this up not to bash Caleb. I mean, if you remember Caleb, he was the one spy who came out of the the land that was to be conquered and said, we can take it, when all the other spies were too afraid of the giants that lived there. And so now, this could be a good or bad statement. With Caleb, we see it as being good, as he's described as a man having a different spirit and being a loyal person, or it can be bad, and the context establishes that, and what do we see with Nabal? And so the writer writer is communicating that to Nabal's core, he is a fool, that he has the demeanor of a dog. He is a low person. If you want to write this in your uh, Bibles, other Greek texts, and as well as the Syriac and Arabic, they translate verse 3 in this way, he was a doggish man. He was a doggish man. Now if we needed any more proof of this, we look at how Nabal responds to David's men. David had been protecting Nabal's herd from, from harm, and when David's men approach him, it was that time of year where shepherds, it was, it was essentially harvest time for herdsmen. It was celebrated with a huge feast, and there was always more than enough. And so the tradition was is that you would share that excess. Well, David comes in and says, can we have some of that excess? And what is Nabal's response? He says, who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? No one mentioned Jesse. Even in his disrespectful remarks, Nabal reveals he knows exactly who David is. You know his dad. (laughs) It's one of those things where it's like uh, there was a professor who was asking, or a teacher was asking a student, you know, why did your mom write your paper? And they go, how would you know? He goes, I didn't, you just told me. And so Nabal's like, who's David? And he mentions his dad when no one mentioned his dad. He knows exactly who David is. And he bashes him and says, there are, several, there are many servants who are breaking away from their masters. And then you see his pride. He shows, shall I give my water and my meat that I've killed from my shears and give it to someone who I don't know where they've come from? Nabal was exactly the man Scripture described him as. But now we get to Abigail, the poor woman married to this beast of a man. Her first introduction is placed between the description of her brutish husband, and it says in verse 3, the name of his wife is Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful. Now ladies, take note of how she's described in the order therein. She is a discerning woman, a woman of good understanding. Abigail is described as a complete contrast of her foolish husband. The Hebrew here defines this trait as someone who is prudent, has insight, understanding, and we'll see that trait on display in a moment. But ladies, physical beauty changes over time, but there is a grading curve 
as it pertains to physical beauty. And do you know what maintains your physical beauty? What keeps you just as beautiful as the day you met your husband? It is what is reflected in your character. Who you are, your character, preserves your beauty. Now we live in a world, so if you're, if you're dating, you know, you know girls who are dating, they're not married. We live in a culture that loves train wrecks. They will pay a lot of money to see a train wreck. And so the women that are put forth in our culture, the reason you're seeing them so up front, the reason you're seeing them so frequently is because the world wants to see the train wreck. And these are the girls that our young women are, are modeling themselves after. Why? Because they're seen, they're noticed. But why are they seen? Why are they noticed? Because the world wants them to crash and burn, and they will. And so modeling your life after that is really only building yourself up to be another train wreck. But I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to look around the church, to look at the women within the church that you would model yourself after them, to look within this body of Christ, to look at women such as Phyllis and Ramona, Nett, Frida, Beverly, and that's just to name a few. That's just scratching the surface of the women in our church that I would be proud for my daughters to be discipled by, to be poured into, because there's going to be a day where as godly as my wife is, my daughters are not going to listen to her anymore. Why? Because our parents know nothing. And I would be proud of so many of the women in this church to speak into their life, to disciple them in that stage, because I did youth ministry. I didn't tell kids anything different than their Christian parents were telling them, but they listened to me for some reason. I've had conferences with parents going, this is what I did, this is what I said, and they go, I've been telling them that for the last three months, but it, it came from someone who wasn't them. I'm not telling them any different, it's just a different voice, and so they listen. And I know the day's coming where they're not gonna listen. But I want them to look at the women in this church and, and be taught the same thing as Paul said. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. There are, there are countless women in this church that are doing exactly that, following Christ. And when that day comes, there needs to be other voices who are following the same king that my daughters can look at and see. And that's in this body. Look around this church and model yourself after the women here, not the women that you see in the culture. But while we are speaking of this beauty that she is being described with having, I want you to note that the Hebrew in this description is a beauty that is unique and it is only attributed to two other women and that is Rachel and Esther. And so when her husband acted like a Nabal, I don't know if we can make that a thing, don't be a Nabal, but he act, when he acted like a fool, Abigail was informed by his shepherds they confirmed everything that David said. And being discerning, she knew who David was. And she knew that he had been acting in mercy and generosity and protecting the herds and the people. And the very fact that he came asking only for what is left over and not coming and taking what he wanted, she saw the mercy in David. Now, do you recall David's response to Nabal's disrespect? We see it in verse 13, and he highlights it again in verse 22. As soon as he gets the news, what does he say? Every man strap on his sword. And so everyone did. And in verse 22, David says, God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. David was coming for battle. And so, brothers and sisters, this, this must spur us for the gospel because this is the same return of Christ. He has in his mercy and generosity given us, without asking, salvation through Christ Jesus. He has placed before us a gift. And we live in a world that responds to this the same way as their father Nabal. Who is Jesus and what should I give him? 
This is my life. This is what I've built. This is my life. See, this world, our friends, our own family have turned their nose up at the gospel. Christ has returned to the Father and he has reported back the navel like demeanor of this world. How do you think the king will return? He will return just as David is returning to Nabal, and that is with a sword. You see, you don't, you don't spit in the king's face and turn your nose up at his gift and get away with it. And this is a warning. The king is returning. And the only way for one to be saved is through Christ Jesus. And it is in Abigail's response that we see the incredible shadow of Christ. Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves, 200 skins of wine, five sheep already prepared, and five seahs of parched grain, and 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. We see her wisdom. I told you we'll see this in, in, in view. And in verse 20, we see her discernment. We see her wisdom. As it says that she traveled to David down under the cover of the mountain. So she knew David was coming for battle and she did not want him to see her off in the distance with all of this stuff. Off in the distance it could be perceived or, or, or misunderstood as someone's coming out to meet for battle. And so rather she approached him that she would be seen at the last minute. And the text tells us in verse 23, when Abigail saw David, it doesn't say when David saw Abigail. When Abigail saw David, she hurried, got down from her donkey, and then she fell at the feet of David with her face bowed to the ground. And once again, she shows her character. One scholar described her actions. Abigail made her appeal to, uh, in utmost humility. She did not come to David as a superior, superior as the beautiful, rich, and privileged often do, or even as an equal. She came to David as a humble servant. Verse 24, she speaks her first words to David, and she says, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. What are we seeing with Abigail? She has brought an abundant offering to David. She's fallen at his feet, and she has asked him to put the guilt on her. She's offering herself to protect both the shepherds who knew David and the foolish alike. She laid down her life that, that she would protect those who were friends of David and enemies of David. And in this action, we see the sh a shadow of Christ who died for the redeemed and the foolish alike. He died for the ones who would receive his gift and for those who would foolishly reject it, thus justifying God's judgment to come. We will all stand before God guilty. I mean, can, can any of us really look at our lives and say that we justly deserve to be spared from God's righteous judgment? All humanity is like the criminals on the crosses beside Jesus. What separates the saved from the other criminal it's we cried out to the man in the middle. See, we have no moral high ground. We have no righteousness of our own to hold over anyone's head. We know the man in the middle, and we received his grace that he was freely giving us. That's what makes us different. Abigail brought an offering before David, quenching his wrath toward Nabal. Likewise, Christ offered himself as an offering before the Father, quenching his wrath toward the sin of any who would call on the name of Jesus. In fact, Isaiah prophesied this in Isaiah 53, verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. Abigail threw herself at the feet of David, seeking to bear the wrongdoing of her husband. She said, on me alone, Lord, be the guilt. I mean, how can we not see Christ in that statement? The shadow that is cast from Abigail takes us directly to the cross. 
even in our brokenness, in our lust, in our pride, in our addiction, in our anger, in our lies, in all of our sin, we have Christ throwing himself down into the flesh of mankind at the feet of the Father and in the garden ultimately praying on me alone be the guilt. Now making kind of a, a, a side note, I'm not willing to call this a shadow, but it is an interesting parallel as Abigail rode a donkey on her way to make atonement and Christ in his triumphal entry also rode on a donkey on his way to make atonement for us. But as we come to the end of this sermon, I want to draw your attention to this imagery found in the marriage of Nabal and Abigail. Abigail leaves David after making atonement and she returns to Nabal. And what I found interesting in verse 27 and 25, it tells us the people around Nabal knew that he was a fool, knew that he was worthless, except Nabal. His servants called him worthless behind his back. They said it to his own wife. His wife called him worthless and petitioning for mercy. Now let's not overlook the importance of self-awareness. Everyone knew he was a fool except the fool. But Abigail returns and Nabal, he's acting as though he were a king with this over-the-top feast and he's hammered. So she decides, I'm not going to tell him what I did tonight. I'm going to wait until morning. When morning comes, she tells Nabal what she had done. And Nabal has a heart attack. Ten days later, he's, he's dead. News of this reaches David. And, and, and how does David respond to Nabal's death? This is what we read. David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. Now on a human level, David could not let such a woman be overlooked. That woman's marriage material. She's not the type of woman who documents her entire life on Facebook. She's not posting revealing pics on Instagram. She's not about drama. This woman has notable character, discerning, wise, humble. Abigail is marriage material. And how does she respond to this proposal? Verse 42, And Abigail hurried. Having been married to a fool, Abigail knew David was marriage material. He was not a fool who acted like a dog. He was able to put aside the wrongdoing of Nabal and give mercy. He was not blinded by his pride. Now David and Abigail were not perfect by any means, but they were marriage material. Well, the same is true for us. We are not perfect. But one of the things that we've got to consider, especially young women, is look at Abigail. Okay, she married, in, 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 in old times, we don't know why. Maybe, maybe she married him because this was a family thing. This was a, a united two families. We have no idea why she married this, this idiot, all right? Some of you have made that statement. I don't want to hear who you're talking about. But what is important for the men and women who are, who are dating and trying to find a spouse is this that you are to conduct and present yourself in such a way that tells them, that tells the opposite sex that you are worth marrying. Marriage is awesome. This is coming from a dude. In this culture, the vast majority of 25-year-olds have no desire to get married. None. And in our culture, they per, we, we, we've, we've basically misconstrued what dating is. And so we have girls who go, look at all these high-caliber men I've dated. Look at what I'm worth. But the question is, is not, not how many men want to date you. The question is, how many men want to marry you? And so on both sides, 
We've got boys with chest hair who don't step up, who don't know what it means to lead, who, who don't even care to see what that looks like. I'll tell you, I wasn't ready for it. When I got married, I was a boy with chest hair. And God comes in and goes, you're not going to be a boy anymore. You're not going to treat my daughter this way. Either I'm going to break you or I'm going to make you. And so that began the process. And then God started bringing men into my life that could minister to me and disciple me to actually be a good husband. So I get it. There's boys who have no desire to be a man. They want to beat their chest and say, I'm a man. I can rent a car now because I'm 25. But they have no desire to actually be leaders. They have no, so I get that. Let, let the men deal with that. All right, men, can we bear responsibility for that and start going after them? But on the other side, ladies, got to be marriage material. Purity is a good thing. Don't listen to this world. They're lying. Both men and women, purity is important. Your character matters. Because marriage is awesome. But what makes a marriage awesome is when a man and a woman come together and go, we're not even going to joke about divorce in this house because that word is not mentioned in this house because it's not an option. Because there's only three means of divorce, but I'm going to love you and treat you well. I'm not going to wander and go astray. Therefore, it's not on the table. That's what makes a marriage successful and happy and thriving. Abigail, plain and simple, was marriage material. David was marriage material. Were they perfect? No. Some of you immediately are thinking, there was a time where he was on his roof and did something pretty messed up. Yeah, he, he wasn't perfect by any means. But they recognized this. But the imagery that I really want us to point to is we have this woman who was married to this beast and she's a bride that is trapped in the embrace of a man that maybe perhaps she feels as though she cannot be rescued from. But then the Lord struck him. And then the king returns to her to take her as his bride. And the imagery that we see in the life of Abigail is like that of the church, made up of men and women who share this broken relationship with sin, trapped in the clutches of this beast, not knowing whether or not we will be set free, but then God crushes the head of the serpent, defeating this beast through the blood of Jesus Christ, and now the king will return for his church of those who are his redeemed. He will return for the ones he has set free and the ones he has rescued. And so my question is this. In hearing this news, will you respond in the like manner of Abigail? She didn't hear the news and then get her life cleaned up first. She didn't hear this news of the king coming for her and, and, and go, oh, let me, let me accomplish this before I do this. No, in hearing the news, our response is to parallel hers, and that is, hurry, don't wait. Because you have no clue what tomorrow will bring. In fact, you have no clue what your drive home will bring. And so if you're not a follower of Christ, if you are lukewarm in something that you profess to be faith, you've heard the news. The king is returning. So hurry. His grace, he has to give you, but it is in Jesus Christ alone. And it is through him that we will be set free, that we will be rescued from the clutches of the beast, that we will be set free and he will return for us his church. But if you do not know him, the Bible speaks of this lukewarmness in Revelation, and it's not good. He says, you're neither hot nor cold, therefore I will spit you out of my mouth. It says, oh, God said, I would respect you more if you just hated me. I'd at least respect you for saying all the worst things in the world about me and just hating my guts than to sit here and say you know me and not. 
It doesn't matter. The news is all the same whether you've been running from him or whether you've been trying to pretend and fake your way through all this. The news is the same, and that is the king is returning. Do you know him? Hurry. But to my brothers and sisters, I want to spur you in this. Never stop falling and cleaving to his grace and his mercy. One of the things I really struggled with as, as a young Christian and, and even as, as I was maturing was I, I, I really struggled with sin, especially habitual sin. It bothered me because I'm imposing on God this view of, of how maybe I would be, and that is at some point you just stop forgiving, right? If someone takes advantage of you, at what point do you break off? You break off the relationship, do you not? That's how we all act. And, it's not a, and I'm not opposed to it. If, if you have a toxic relationship that you keep pouring into and, it, and it's only making it worse, at some point you got to cut it off. And so all I was thinking of is at what point is God just going to cut me off? I want to follow him. I want to pursue him. But I'm surely, I'm getting to that point where he's going to go, I'm done with you. I'm, no, no more. Because that's what I would do. And I remember someone proposing this imagery of, I want you to go out and I want you to get a cup from the ocean and then I want you to, to take it and I want you to water this or let's just let's say a lake because you can actually drink that and drink it and then go get another one and then go get another one. Eventually rain will come, eventually things will flow and that lake will be filled up yet again. And the imagery they were portraying to me is, is you will never drink up God's grace. He will never run out of grace to give you. He will never run out of mercy. Why? Because you're his. Because you're his child. Because you're his son. You're his daughter. Why would he ever wear out his grace for you? And so if you're a follower of Christ and you've been wrestling, you've been struggling with this, you need to understand something. You have not even scratched the surface of draining any of his grace. You're not even close to using it up. There is so much more to be given to you. Do not think and fall for that lie that he's about to shut the door on you and say, you know what? I'm cutting this relationship off. It's toxic. He knew it was going to be toxic. That's why he went to the cross. He knew we couldn't do it. He knew we would fall short. But God shows us love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. At your worst, he died. So now being covered by his blood, why would he leave you now? And so if you're here and that's something you've been wrestling with, I want to encourage you during this time of invitation to come forward and just be encouraged and built up. But if you do not know Jesus as Savior, respond in the same way of Abigail as David is returning. Hurry. Hurry run down this aisle of freedom and come to meet your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the shadows that we see in the life of Abigail. We see just one chapter describing this woman and what an incredible woman she is. I pray, Father, that as we go back and we read this chapter, that we would see the shadows that point directly to you. I pray, Father, that in each of our lives, that as we follow you, as we surrender to our sanctification, that we would be quick to respond in the same way that Abigail has responded, that she would get between and offer herself, that she would be an atoning sacrifice for others. And, and that may not mean that we actually lay down our life, but it does mean that we get between our kids and their addiction. It means that we get between our friend in a relationship, it means that we get between those who are hurting and the things that are hurting them and offer ourselves up that we would minister to them and care for them and love them through it. Father, build up in us that we would be a greater sacrifice, that we would be willing to sacrifice each and every day, pour ourselves out and trust in you that you will fill us up again so we can go and pour ourselves out and lay ourselves down. Lord, build in us this character of Abigail that is a character of your son, Christ Jesus. Father, work in us and shape us and mold us into his image. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.